Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of the Manic Movie Misfits podcast. I am your co-host, John Phillips. I'm the other guy, Trevor Chick. And, we, as you can see with the bottom screen down below us, hi, John. I'm looking at you right now. What's up, In yo? the editing. Huh? Yeah. You. Good. Oh, wait. So... Just can't, so I would have to go. No, no, yeah, yeah, you'd have to look up. Were you looking down for there for a second? No, no, no. <laughs> I was looking up that way, but since the right. right here. Right, right. So. Yes, so as you can see from the secondary screen below, the for the people that are that are watching this podcast episode, the secondary screen down below, John Henchman is joining us. The other John, John mm -hmm. Squared. He and I together are John Squared. And, and you guys know him. He's been on the podcast before. And John's here to, to talk to us about, and talk with us about Oppenheimer. Thank you, John, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. What, uh, the last time we were talking about this before, the last time you were on the podcast was when we were in Tahoe, wow. on the pier. What a change. Almost a year ago today. We were talking about the best water movies of all time. <laughs> and I brought up uh, the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. Yes. Rightfully I, so. I really appreciate that. We got some animation there. I think that was the only animated movie that was talked about, I think. I think we talked about Ponyo. If I oh, that's right. We did. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we did. But you know what you did do? You educated me on SpongeBob. Because I had only I had seen barely an episode. And I'd yet to show you guys the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. That is true. Yeah. So if uh, Calvin ends up coming and we all hang out, that's the movie we're watching. And we're doing it. We should do a podcast episode on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Let's do it. Okay. It's a date. It's, we are literally it's called. <laughs> we are literally called the Mag Movie Misfits. We. It, it's. It's in our name. We have to do it. It's. It's. It's an obligation at this point. Oh, peak cinema. <laughs> it, truly. Prove me wrong. That's the. That's the one with Keanu Reeves, right? That's, yeah. No. It's oh. uh, David Hasselhoff. Oh, Keanu Reeves in the second one. Yeah. I haven't seen that one, and I'm not really. Oh, the third one. Yeah. Wow, the second one's the pirate one, isn't it? I, I don't, I don't, I didn't really watch past the first one because I, I didn't want to be bad so look, long. John, for a SpongeBob lover. Bad look. Mm, a, yeah. a true SpongeBob lover stopped watching after season three. Oh, really? Yeah. How many seasons are there? Like fifteen. Oh, I think it's still going. Well. Wow. What's that? Uh, oh. SpongeBob. Yeah. SpongeBob has thirteen seasons. Okay. Should we just talk about SpongeBob lore instead of Oppenheimer today? Oh yeah, I, uh, you know they're oddly similar because I, you uh, know what? Kenny Bottom goes off like I a, was not recording that entire time. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. Um. <laughs> I was about to, I was about to make such a cool parallel. We're good though because I have that audio. What is, is that? The, what is use the camera audio? Okay, for that uh, it's it's not as good, but it, we it was only for a couple minutes. Okay, and you're and, recording now, and I'm recording now. I want to keep that intro. That was a good intro. So. Fun fact, uh, Bikini Bottom, there's a theory that it was um, basically based off some nuclear bomb tests in, oh, I forget where, but... Um, the Pacific. <laughs> yeah, it was probably, yeah, yeah. The Pacific, and then um, blew up, and all the, the nuclear fallout basically fell down to what became to be known as Bikini Bottom. So, hmm. like, all the radioactivity... Um, yeah, it's kind of Godzilla-esque. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, cool. Yeah, it does there's, relate. there's three SpongeBob movies. The first one, yeah, it's just called Sp uh, SpongeBob SquarePants movie. The second one is Sponge Out of Water, where it looks like they become superheroes. Mm -hmm. Dang. Yeah, it's and a then, different animation. Yeah, there's one that came out 2020 called Sponge on the Run, and that <laughs> one has Keanu in it. Mm. Can we get Paul McCartney in the wings to do Sponge on the Run? <laughs> Sponge on the Run. <laughs> Oh my god, I love it, <laughs> dude! Wow. Well, literally, Licensing. Paul McCartney, right? Didn't he say he's he's still doing? He did that AI song, right? Oh or he's god. going to do that AI song with the Beatles? Have you heard of that? Heard about oh. that? Oh. Yeah, yeah. So Paul McCartney is claiming that the Beatles' last official song is this song that he's. I think he's making at the moment, where I he's using AI and unused Beatles voice recordings to no make a Beatles song. Way. Yeah. And he's claiming it's it's stupid. I did okay. Yeah, it is stupid. And yeah, you can't tell me otherwise. Yeah, AI it's is kind of. It's not the no 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 no. I'm not saying AI specifically. I'm saying like that a whole idea. What what McCartney's doing? That's uh, not the last Beatles song. The last Beatles song. It, yeah, is the it, one it, where it they does, all knew that they were when they were all actually alive and singing together. Yeah, it almost yeah. it almost does uh, um, almost almost dancing on the grave per se. 
Yeah it's, yeah, it's not out yet, but it'll be out later this year, according to McCartney. Oh, Lord. Wow. It'll get a lot of traction for the meme and other things, probably, but... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I could see it. Well, speaking of going back in time, you know, going back in time, talking about the Beatles, the Beatles, we're going to go back in time even further and talk about Oppenheimer. Oh, good segue. Thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty good at those, you know. <laughs> just, you know, just saying. We all watch it together. Along with Riley, who has been Riley Robarsh, who has been on this podcast before, mm-hmm. and another one of our friends, Brody, who has not been on this podcast before, but would be an absolute treat on this on oh, this podcast. Truth. Yeah, mm-hmm. we saw it Monday, so it's been we've had some time to sort of digest it, think about it, think it, what 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 our official scores are on it, what we liked, what we disliked. Hint: There's not a lot of things that we disliked about it. And so, with that being said, John. Being the generous host, co-host that I am, mm. I'm going to open it up to you first. Well, you know, I'm you have you know it's a big deal here. First, it is a big deal. First here, first answer here, first response, first comment on Oppenheimer. What? And this is as we always do. What stood out to you? Give us one one thing to get this conversation going that stood out to you with Oppenheimer. You know, I'm going to take a poetic approach here oh. and start. At the end, okay. so We're I must be say, talking spoilers just so we say oh, this right good, now. Good point. Yes. Well, yeah, we, we can do we that. Will be. Yeah, we, we let's just get into it now. We usually wait a little, but we can just because we do. It yeah, I can start earlier. If, mm. No, no, no. It's fine. Let's let's just get into it. Okay. There's so it's so. This is one of those films that just deserves to jump right in. Okay. Fair so enough. great, great point, TJ. Spoilers. We are starting in Uno, Dos, Trace, McFarland. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I think the scene that kind of hit me the hardest, n- not necessarily the hardest, but I felt, oh, um, well, yeah, it, it, it moved me the most um, okay. was that last shot um, after Albert Einstein had walked away and you see Killian Murphy in color, um, his like his beautiful eyes objectively blue, beautiful eyes crystal blue eyes man just l- staring down into the lake where he's now um uh cuz i believe they were talking about the the weight of their inventions and like the the curse of their inventions really right they were talking about how eventually you will be like resurrected you eventually will be thought of in a bright in a brighter light mm-hmm. but you, you know, have to, 30 years down the road you but, still have to deal with the weight of yeah. your creation um yeah. and i think him looking down at the lake and seeing those raindrops to me it symbolized um you know the future of all these well hopefully not the future but um all these nukes basically being dropped because of those um mm-hmm. uh, those explosions and just looking down at that, the color and everything, I don't know. I, th- I thought the build-up to that was so perfect in, in the um, significance of just that interaction with Albert Einstein. Um, that's a whole other thing. But just him looking down at the lake, seeing the lake, and all those like minuscule explosions, I thought was really put it into an ethical perspective. Yeah. It was really cool to see Nolan go as abstract as he does with a lot of those different things. The raindrops, the, like, all the mini, like, what do you call it? Like, lines, you know, laser lines or whatever those things are. Mm-hmm. And and the, you know what I'm talking about? How he has those wavy, like, lines. Oh, in his mind in, like, the beginning? When he's, like, thinking about... Well, he, I think he cuts through it a few times. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Is it where the sound just kind of like comes in and is like, wham, it's the, no, that's later, sorry. Um, kind of in the beginning when he's thinking about the atom. Yeah, it shows up there, but I think it shows up like at least a couple times after the fact. Like it, it's yeah. spliced in the middle of things. Okay. Yeah, it's mostly in the beginning, but um, they, they cut back to it every now and then. Through, yeah. Um, yeah. Especially when they're talking science and stuff like that. They'll, they'll be like, this thing, and then show it and stuff like that. So, Yeah. No, I, I really like that because Nolan primarily has done his very, like, you know, scientific, straight-on approach to filmmaking. He doesn't really 
in his a lot of his past movies hasn't given that the breaks that he does like he does in this movie to do, show scenes like the raindrops or what I was talking about with those laser waves and things like that. So I, that's a great point. I really I, I like your take on that. I like your take on that. Yeah, yeah. TJ, hmm. what's something that stood out to you? I mean, uh, it, I mean, scene wise, I think that's the best scene of the movie. I mean, yeah, straight up. Uh, so I mean, like I, I, I mean, like there's not much to say other than like scene wise, where it's like that is like that's the pinnacle of the movie. But um, I mean, Cillian Murphy, just straight up. He's super good in the movie. Yeah. Like, uh, probably, I mean, he's definitely getting that Oscar nom, but, I mean, shit, he could win an Oscar, no problem, I think. Um, we all knew he had that potential. Oh, absolutely. I mean. Going in. Um, and I'm not, I'm not doubting that, but, yeah. um, I'm just saying, like, it, it was everything we expected and more. It, it was, it was, it was a damn good performance, and, um, I mean, I think everyone knew going in that, like, He's going to probably get that Oscar now. He's probably going to get the Oscar. Yeah. Because, I mean, historical fiction movies and stuff like that uh, win big there. But um, Yes, they do. Yeah, it, he, he's damn good in this movie and uh, deserves all the praise. Yeah, I think a common theme between these two points here is is Killian Murphy. Oh, absolutely. So, I think we should get into We can get into that some more. And I will add on to that one thing that and it, John, you and I talked about this after the movie. That's a, that's kind of funny. Is you feel you obviously really want to talk about the movie after, but then it's kind of sometimes we're kind of um, going over past conversation in the podcast. So I'm going to do that here. Mm-hmm. And one thing that was re- that I really enjoyed and I thought was great acting wise, and actually, no, I won't go there. But is the is the 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 sadness, the terror the anger, all these different emotions that you can see through Killian Murphy's face without overdoing it, overacting, or exploding on that. It's all very contained. And it's so much more effective that way. Mm -hmm. Because it affects you as an audience member more. Because you almost, you feel it more, and you, it's, it's very much along the lines of the same thing, where it's like, you know in horror movies, where they'll they won't show like the like the monster or the creature and you build this emotion you build this like imagination of what that monster is and it gets scarier and scarier and scarier it's like the same thing mm-hmm. but with his facial expressions and so it garners so much more emotion that you have towards him and and it displays it so... Oh, shit, sorry. I went to go adjust it just a little bit. An atomic bomb just went off there. It did. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's good. Which bomb? Me. <laughs> it's... Yeah, it's so much more effective. And I, th- I hope you guys felt the same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100% yeah. agree. I think... Um, yeah, it just... I think, Johnny, you were saying um, like when the actor uh, kind of lets, lets it all out, you know, just like cries or what have you... Um, it kind of takes away or even um the comedic approach like adding you know if a if a if an actor would laugh at their own joke yeah. it would be a lot less funny exactly um but you know in the very opposite extreme he's dealing with these pretty heavy heavy topics and a lot of weight on his shoulders yeah but he's just kind of taking it as the viewer would and so the viewer is just left just kind of in this really claustrophobic space and Mm -hmm. has to kind of express it on their own. That's a great point is you do kind of feel like you are kind of stuck in stone. You're kind of all you're, you're, you're controlled. You're being controlled. You're being restrained because of that performance that he's giving. That's a great point. I like that. Also, what was kind of cool was seeing the, 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 the progress of the film solely off of, Killian's emotions. Like, if you think about it, you could definitely do that. You could just pick out screenshots or brief clips of what Killian's, what Oppenheimer's face looks like throughout, especially that last hour when he progressively just gets more and more beat down by the um, the board that's reviewing his security clearance. And you could clearly tell what stage the movie is at. It's just another great example of 
why this is such a great performance and is if and you know let's say someone does have trouble with some of the the plot things or the how the plot's constructed or something else they can you can really specifically sit down and enjoy that and abs- it is absolutely fantastic i i can't think of a performance like that I mean, well i'm sure there are others out there but recently where you really can this is at least the first time that i've really thought about that where you could take I mean, i'm sure there's others but recent in recent movie history a performance like this where you where it is that good and that detailed where you can follow it throughout a movie and understand just solely on facial expressions where the movie's at i thought that was an, a, really cool mm-hmm. i think too we should also shout out other acting performances because <laughs> there was a lot of people in this movie a lot of people i kind of compared it to it's a mad 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 world honestly mm-hmm. because yeah with It's Mad, 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 Mad World, which, John, you were there for that podcast episode. That I was. One of the cool sort of behind-the-scenes his, behind, history of that movie, right, is all the comedic geniuses wanted to be on that movie because they knew it was going to be huge. It had a big budget. It had a great director. They knew it was going to be awesome, and it was going to have a long-lasting impression. And clearly that is the same with this movie. Everyone, I mean, Nolan's reputation is incredible. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, Interstellar, Dark Knight. And so everyone wanted to work on this movie, and it shows. It it ri- the cast rivals. The, it's a Mad 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 World cast back then. Easy. What other performances jumped out at you guys? I mean, I've ri- I wrote I've written down Strauss here. Obviously, Robert Downey Jr. Mm. He is he is he's good. He's great, especially that last 30, 30 minutes. Mm. He is he is yeah. incredible. That's mm. where where he really comes out to shine. He's kind of like a background player through the re- whole rest of the movie. Yeah, mm. just kind of narrating here and there. But well, then when he actually like, gets the chance to act, he 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 goes hard. Yeah, he's you hate him so much. He's like oh. a snake. He is um the way he 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 um tries to get Oppenheimer and. I, I think of that one scene in particular where I love scenes where you'll have a character reveal who they truly are in like a second and or like a character is trying to hold this fake persona up and then drops it because they're in such like they're in the dumps they're at the they're at the very edge and there's that one scene with Alden Ehrenreich and the other guy I can't remember the actor's name or I think he's another lawyer but where he, you realize his true intentions, and he starts getting evil. He start, he starts, uh, he starts, he starts insulting Alden Ehrenreich's character and getting angry with him. I love moments like that. It's so, it's so sinister and so um, chilling to watch that. And and Robert Downey Jr. is, I mean, a fantastic actor. Mm-hmm. He really is. I, before, I mean, before Iron Man, he was a fantastic actor. And obviously, you know, alcohol, drug issues had problems there. He had problems with that, but people only remember, really remember him from Iron Man but uh, I was glad to see him take a more nothing against the Iron Man performance which is great yeah take a different a different role and a different a different character right because this character lacks the charisma and the sort of suave that Tony Stark that Tony Stark requires yeah it is very much more <laughs> black and white you know black and white get mm. it because there's a black and white there <laughs> black and white um, type of character and that didn't have that fashion to him and I thought that was I yeah. thought he needed that I yeah. thought he needed that well yeah I mean like Robert Downey Jr. He, I mean he was making so much money the last 10 years he didn't have to do anything else <laughs> no. other than the Iron Man movie so like fair enough yeah. I mean he did make some other stuff like there's like the lawyer or the jury or whatever that one's called apparently he's really good in that too but, like it never made waves kind of like mm-hmm. what this will probably do for his career but yeah, I mean, shit. People have been talking about Oscar noms for him and stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm I'm here for it. So yeah, I was I was it was kind of funny. I was questioning literally until those last thirty minutes, sort of. I was I I was wondering why people were giving him this much hype, and then there was the scene as the one I just mentioned, and a few after. Then I realized, okay, this is what they're talking about. Because before he's good, but I it didn't it didn't kick me in the face like a lot of other. People were talking. People were talk like a lot of other you know best supporting actors uh, winners in the past, but then that last thirty minutes happened and I realized wow this is this, this is, is it. awesome. 
another comparison too that I thought was interesting was, and this is because I don't know why. I guess I just had Boogie Nights on my mind, but <laughs> she just like, where's this going? <laughs> um, yes, a movie about porn, making porn movies, and Oppenheimer. Yes, <laughs> no, so. Hell yeah. Is is Burt Reynolds, actually. So Burt Reynolds in that movie plays a very different character as well than he had, was known for. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was an interesting parallel between that that kind of... And they bo- and, and Burt got nominated for an Oscar for that movie. Tony... Pro- or, um, Tony Stark. RDJ. <laughs> RDJ will probably get nominated for that movie. But I love that... Again, I love that career choice from both of them. It's a good movie. You should check it out, John Boogie Nights. Yeah. Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's good. It's good. But I just wanted to shout that out because I thought that was interesting. Yeah. It, as much as Robert Downey Jr. was was a different character, I think, is uh, is Iron Man and versus Straws, I think, more or less, it was, you know, kind of the beginning of Iron Man 1 where he's, you know, kind of this stuck-up, stubborn, selfish um, politician, really. Because True. in Iron Man, he's like this what arm salesman and you know he's kind of dealing with the same thing in in oppenheimer um just without the flash exactly because you know tony stark is all about the sports all cars about, and yeah, the, yeah 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 but i think what kind of gave me that iron man-esque vibe was when he um was kind of getting talked down to by um by solo what's his name all in Yeah, yeah yeah so kind of getting um getting talked back to um and he really just got it served to him and he leaves the the room like distraught but ends up like putting on that smile for all the mm, um, yeah oh yeah for all the paparazzi and that that like smile alone was like oh that's iron man right yeah that's that's a that's a fair comparison though again not as flashy Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. It was more. I don't. I don't mean to say there aren't people out there like Tony Stark because there definitely are, but it it felt more. That sort of performance felt more real. It oh. felt more natural. Mm-hmm. You know, something that would actually happen because it you know actually happened. But yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. It, it was very more. Um, a lot more classy. Yes. Um, Agreed. But yeah, and, and that's not to. Um, comparing that to Iron Man is not to um, downplay his no. role as straws because he he did an incredible job. Well, and I want to be clear here. Iron Man is a fantastic performance. It really is. He People don't understand how... Sometimes people don't understand how perfect RDJ was for that role and oh, that yeah. there are very, very few actors that could have put in that performance for that kind of character. Oh yeah, I very mean, few. I feel like some of those Marvel front runners are like perfect choices. Mm, like yes, Chris Evans is a perfect Captain America. Like no one else could do Cap- Captain America like Chris Evans. Yeah, like same kind of idea. Agreed. We were kind of talking about the sort of the the kind of natural aspect to RDJ's character, and I feel like that carried through to. And I, I don't want to stomp on any other performances. So if there's any other performances, please let me know before we move on, or you can bring them up later. But all I guess we can, you know, we talked about Alden Ehrenreich for a little. Mm-hmm. For his little bit, he was he was great in it too. I loved how he challenged the RDJ character, and his best moments were when he did that. Right, I, I loved his sort of smirks and smiles, mm-hmm. and what he realized that RDJ was down in the dumps and was about to get thrown down on. And wasn't going to get the cabinet seat for Eisenhower's when he Eisenhower was president, and he put because I, I, I actually saw hype for him as well, but I wasn't sure why. But then again, I I found out why again. It really is those last thirty minutes because mm-hmm. you see all that change, and you to me you see the value in Aaron Reich's performance because of him going up against such an established actor like Downey putting in that performance and then to not um, downgrade those scenes with him in it by rising up to the occasion and acting on that on a very similar level and being a great... I don't want to say backboard, but I, I guess I'll say backboard, but not, I'm not trying to say that in a demeaning way. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's very much like he is receiving that... receiving the dialogue, the acting from RDJ... And 
and re- and responding to it very well. It's not one of those because sometimes in movies when you have a really great performance and then you have other actors that are kind of just like meandering around and kind of just faces it kind of it feels like it goes right through them especially when there's like heated argument scenes i never felt that once with alden aaron reich i thought he was he was he was good in it too really was yeah and and there's i mean there's numerous other actors we can talk about and they'll probably come up later in conversation Mm. when we talk about things but as i was saying earlier about the sort of that natural aspect that Downey's character had, I thought that definitely translated, or I should say, or vice, really simultaneously, not translated, but simultaneously, the dialogue was also helping that. It was a very sort of natural, grounded dialogue throughout the entire film. And that is, there's, I think there's some issues with it, but what did you think, John, of, of the, the, the writing for the movie, the dialogue of the movie? What did you think of all that? You know, I'm not going to lie. In the beginning, it was a bit much um, how fast everything was moving. Yeah. um, Because there's a lot to take in. Like, you know, brought me back to eighth grade history. Like, (laughs) I I was rusty. uh, Right. I didn't know I was that rusty. But, um, yeah, I mean, honestly, a lot of it, you know, while it wasn't integral to the rest of the plot, I thought it was um, still important information. So... I mean, the fact that it was kind of grazed over was almost necessary because there's just so much to set up for that time. Um, But yeah, I mean, you know, I think I feel like I have to watch it a second time to really um, understand the the dialogue. And I don't think that should really downplay its its, um, overall effect, but I I would just need to watch it at least once more to kind of make a fair judgment of that dialogue. Yeah. I I had a similar reaction especially when thinking of thinking of how I don't know. No one has this issue and we talked about it before the podcast started. But his dialogue is just way too quiet, too much. Mm. And when you have that in conjunction with these complicated subjects and that they're talking about and the in the the large amount of characters that are speaking and saying these important things it really does not help because you're you have to be so focused and then even then you miss some things and that can affect your viewing experience later on down the road by missing a few words here and there that end up being really important because i was talking about that one of the things that to me made the dialogue so natural is they never overemphasized like those big like light bulb moments or those big like wordy you know speeches that were some that were like the the pinnacle of a scene the the um again like that light bulb moment real central to it it was all very much it was very much just natural conversation natural dialogue natural conversation between scientists the courts and and so I loved that piece, but then again, and I think, and I'm glad the way it turned out. I would have much rather have done have that, them have done that than doing what I was saying earlier, which was make a big spectacle of certain lines of dialogue because that is not life. Now it works really well for movies a lot of the time. It's not great for necessarily life. So as I was saying about the that problem with the natural dialogue is I'd much rather have that. It is more natural. It's less cheesy than, than, than that sort of one sentence spotlight type of dialogue in scenes, but it doesn't, but in this case it doesn't work with that quiet dialogue that no one seems to always have. So to me, and I guess this is a good point to say that, that to me that is a one of my my very few 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 knocks on the film. And again, I've, we've said this about other Nolan movies before. Everyone has. It's not a it's not a new it's not a new thing. But I think that's important to mention because it does require things like a second viewing, and for you to pay even more attention. But then even so, you still miss things. It's just. It creates a whole a whole world of things, both good and bad, and but it should be mentioned. 
Yeah, I, it's you know while it, it is difficult to um, understand that dialogue the first time through, I don't think that's necessarily a knock because it, at least in my opinion, if you know, I think that just um, increases its its watchability and okay. longevity um, because I can watch that movie a million times and notice something new every time. Um, and scenes I would have seen, you know, I would have already seen, um, you know, just kind of appreciating that dialogue more once I knew it. Okay. Um, and just kind of the feeling of, um, you know, what they're saying. It's not, sometimes it's not necessarily the content, um, when you already kind of have watched the movie. Um, but it's more, I don't know, just that delivery I think is... It's it can be a worthy sacrifice, but it is. I mean, it is a long movie, so it's mm-hmm. it's hard to say that. Oh, it's fine that you didn't hear the dialogue the first time. Just watch it again because three hours is a lot of time to set aside for a movie. Yeah. Well, and I think, and that is a good point, and that's with all again that you can say that with the with all the Nolan, Nolan movies that do have that quieter dialogue. You can definitely. It is a thing that you can overcome for sure. But I do think that. Nonetheless, I think it does affect the viewing experience, and mm. and for me that for me that is a knock. But I don't want to total. I don't want to ran our parade because this is this is a a fantastic movie, and we can talk about it at the very end where we generally rank this for us or uh, for Nolan movies. We won't do a full list like we did with Mission Impossible, but we can talk about it for a few, couple minutes or so. But going going back to to we can go back to to performances because well I guess I'll get this out of the way because I don't I, I'll get out I'll get out my my cons out of the way and then if anyone has anything else they'd like to mention and then we can get on to all the good stuff but I don't know if, I don't know if you guys had this issue but and I know this is technically you know history or whatever so a lot of the stuff did happen but th- this could have been could have been changed and this is crucial because it is part of the climax of the movie is Rami Malek's big scene where he comes in and talks about, you know, the the credibility of Oppenheimer and how he is this great scientist that has um, morals and things of that nature. To me, that kind of came out of left field because we had literally seen Malik for two other scenes and he was just holding a clipboard and saying nothing. And so for him to come out and say this big have this big speech where it sounds like he's best friends with Oppenheimer kind of was a little jarring to me. And I, and one and made me question almost right away or it took me out of the movie a little bit. I will be honest because I was, I just kind of was like, wait, what this is, you haven't spoken once and you're giving us this big monumental scene. And it, and it probably did happen actually because you know, this is based on American Prometheus, the the book on Oppenheimer, and that is a very well documented um, sort of courtroom um, thing. And so, I'm sure that actually happened. I just would have liked a few scenes with Rami Malek's character actually engaging with Oppenheimer for something like that to happen. So there was this bridge between what he's say, actually saying and us actually being able to experience, and the audience actually seeing that connection being made with those two because it could have very well happened i don't know for sure it could have very well happened and if it did that's great i think there should have at least been a couple scenes or at least even a scene telling us that i think it would have made that final big because this is a crucial part right this is literally the ending of the film almost is him Mm -hmm. saying is all the there's and there was others we should say there are other i do know this there were other scientists that came out and said this as well i mean you saw it in the in the security clearance hearing or sort of yeah sort of discussion but bored but i would have liked that i don't know if you guys had trouble with that and that's why i wanted to ask but i definitely did yeah do you want to go all right that's all you yeah that that that, i i I totally agree yeah um yeah I, i i i think it's just one of those things where it's it i think there's just a lot of people in this movie and if they just kind of like even just streamlined the amount of people in there just a little bit and been like i know this is a little bit un like historical but add this character here make it just oh make a little more sense 
Like, don't do a whole JFK thing when, like, invent characters, but, like... <laughs> Kevin Bacon uh, yeah. in that movie. <laughs> but, like, um, at, at one point, you, you're going to have to, like, sacrifice that for plot, you know, like, whatever. Because just adding a, a random face for a scene, although it's great, uh, you could just have this character be someone else and in the plot and make it make more sense later. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, you probably could have cut number of cameos in that movie and um streamlined them and no nothing would have changed <laughs> yes i mean you, you could cut nat wolf from that movie and nothing would change mm-hmm. um which is sad because i mean he's a great actor but i mean he i think he says maybe three things in the movie if that and he's uh, he's in the background of like every scene mm-hmm. but well that's a great point to bring up tj is maybe adding in a character that it wasn't totally there to begin with mm-hmm. to help with that i think that totally would have been cool because one thing that that is official is that albert einstein did not have that conversation with oppenheimer and that did not that conversation that we were talking about that very last conversation did not happen with albert einstein it was with a different scientist so i don't know why no one put that scene in there but he did i mean probably to what, make it more eventful be like it's yes the meeting of the two greatest science minds in the last 100 years that's what i was I was figuring too, TJ. I imagine that's oh, probably yeah. what that's it was because yeah. everyone because everyone knows. Oh, that's that's Albert Einstein. It's you know yeah. everyone can recognize the white mustache and the in yeah. that face, and so that's probably what happened. But because that scene was included, I think very well that's a great idea. Is they could have just brought in a character that maybe was like sort of a character like that that was sort of there, or like a half character sort of thing. Yeah, someone was at least in the background of scenes that you can notice. <laughs> yeah. To sort of make it more natural and not just have this random occurrence of Rami Malek having this crucial moment in the in in the film, so I think that's that's important to point out. But that's kind. Of, I I let's move past that. Let's talk about some other 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 great great things in the film. And one of those is the editing, whether it's sound editing, the edit, regular editing itself, sound design. <sighs> Incredible. I will say one of my favorite moments was the was the um, was the for a, for a storytelling for, from the from the aspect from story from a te- storytelling perspective, editing perspective was the the stomping of the feet, that reoccurrence, that motif mm-hmm. constantly showing up. And I thought it was so good because it was, I mean, it was edited so well because of where it was placed. It was placed so well. It was brought in so in, in the, in the crucial in very crucial moments and showed great sort of, it really helped. I feel like audience members understand this turmoil that Oppenheimer's going through because it kind of serves that juxtaposition of stomping of the feet, remember, because that's from the, the the kind of the town hall meeting, right, where they're all, like, cheering and about this triumph that this, you know, this basically this town had, because everyone was behind this, of creating the, the atomic bomb. And so it kind of, it was really cool. It, it, it was that exact turmoil of, on one side, you have them, it is this great triumph and everyone's celebrating, but on the other hand, it created such sadness and destruction and anger for a lot of people and i thought that was a great thing to constantly show up through the film because it did serve those two sort of different juxtaposing sides and really gave the audience better perspective into this well the world that oppenheimer is in and the and the and the, and the things that he's hearing because you hear you he he's obviously on that more he's on that one side he's dealing with all this turmoil this depression this sort of limbo that he's in but then there is that strong triumph that all these other people around him are feeling because of and it makes sense taking pride in something like that and all the time that was committed to it so that was one thing from the editing standpoint and storytelling standpoint that I I thought was 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 fantastic and added to added great depth to the film we kind of mentioned earlier about the other sort of editing with the um 
sort of like the random not they're not random they're placed correctly but the sort of the the waves and a lot of other things like that any any moments or just overall editing sound design that stood out to you i mean sound design was whew, insane the dude the trinity test Oof. wow that one of my favorite um scenes of all time mm-hmm. um trust me this relates is okay. uh actually i don't want to have you guys seen better call Saul? no okay. I'm, i it's on my i finished breaking bad but i got i got to get to it I've okay bits and pieces but that's too crazy well is it, this a spoiler or no n- not really okay. I'll, I'll just i'll just be very vague about it it's okay. it basically has to do with the same um uh same concept of um light traveling faster than sound okay so you'll see it and then hear it later yeah um and just it reminded me so much of that that i I was already so excited for that explosion because i mean they're you know so far from this explosion um and just that wonderful silence of not not only the film but i think respectfully all of the audience members as packed as that theater was, I mean, there was not a seat that wasn't filled. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty pretty much. And, you know, typically there's always going to be those people, like, whispering or whatever. But in, in my, where I was sitting, I heard nobody. <laughs> and I think, DJ, that was a different experience for you. But <laughs> I, I, it, where I, from where I was sitting, I had a brilliant, brilliant experience just with that explosion. Yeah, that Trinity test. Yeah. Well, I mean, and same for me. We're just piling on TJ at this point. Same for me. It was dead silent. So to have all those people be so be so silent and so quiet and to, to see that with them all and then to have the sound show up later, like what would actually happen in the actual tests in, in life is was just breathtaking i mean it's what do you expect it's christopher nolan i mean he's gonna do that he's gonna do that kind of stuff technical all that technical stuff he's gonna do to the highest level that i don't think any of us even had a question of whether that was gonna be good or not going in i i mean it's it's like life death nolan uh with all his technical stuff Mm -hmm. it's just yeah it's it's crazy I, i was gonna say something and then i forgot about that oh this is this is kind of a, a kind of a side to that, but that was where I really noticed like that great cinematography. At one and is, and having the seventy millimeter IMAX is because the the sh- the few the shot there really is one there's really one main shot where it shows when the explosion is at its highest peak, its highest level, and with that seventy millimeter IMAX, you can see the full thing, right? The full explosion from top to bottom because of that aspect ratio was that shot i mean the, the whole movie experience but that shot in particular seeing in the theater and imax will stay with me in my mind because it looked so real because it was i mean it wasn't an actual obviously atomic bomb but you know no one with perspective and other things like that with the camera was able to capture it to make it look like that and and with lots of explosives let's be real here there was still lots of explosives used it just is going to be stuck in my brain along with that. And I don't mean to go off on a tangent here, but we are the man of movie misfits podcast here. The cinematography just, even if it wasn't 70 millimeter, I mean, I'm sure that helped. One thing I loved about it was, you know, people talk about cinematography telling its own story or being able to help help tell the story, not just shoot it, right? I mean, obviously, it helps tell the story by shooting it, but actually conveying other things that in the film and and the the gravity and sort of godlike it gave the bomb, the Trinity bomb, this this godlike sort of weight to it and gravity to it right remember those shots where everyone's like well there's the shot where they're putting it together 
and then they have the shot where everyone's walking around it, and there's that one final moment where Oppenheimer's walking around it. And they also they all they, they do it several times. They show it going up in the air, right to the top of the tower. The way that the way that Hoity Van Hoytema is shooting that is adds such a layer. The way he's kind of moving around it and just resting on it adds so much to me. Adds like this added this chilling chilling aspect to it. Where you were, I mean, you, of course you're afraid of it as an atomic bomb. Like, you should have that naturally. You should have this, you should have this attention to it. But I felt like that cinematography added, added even more of that. Where you really kind of got a perspective and an, an idea of just how, like, yeah. And I would add this, I'm, I'm adding more and more words here. But almost like a, like a, like a, yeah, like a mythic, godlike this heavy gravity to it that if it was just sort of like plain Jane cinematography wouldn't have had, I don't think. And I, I love that piece to it. That's just, and Hoyt Van Hoytema is, is the best of the best for IMAX. He is, I think people now, especially with some of his last couple films, Nope. And this one, I mean, it's kind of come to light that, yeah, this dude is like the best when it comes to messing around with IMAX cameras and shooting. Oh yeah. Just, a, a a fantastic job on his part and obviously we talked about the explosion shooting that see, being able to see all of that and yeah I just thought was was incredible was there any was there any before I don't want to leave editing behind so was there any other things about editing or cinematography that you guys wanted to to shout out Oh, oh, you know what? You know what was interesting? And we, we, and this is actually, this is a great transition into pacing. We were talking about pacing. We had this conversation outside the theater. How fast the movie is up until the Trinity explosion. And at first, and this, this is, oh gosh, man, this is going to be so juiced. Um, so, so, so that, excuse me. Um, <laughs> anyway, so you have, you have like the fast pace cutting editing up until the Trinity explosion. And at first it, it was a little, um, kind of, it took me out of the movie just a little bit. Cause I was like, why is this thing going so damn fast? Like it just keeps going and going and going. And I'm trying to. One thing I love in a movie is when there's some long opening scenes where you can kind of just, or or there's a few quick scenes and there's like a couple longer scenes that you can kind of sit down and get into the movie and get into that world. But this just wasn't doing it. It was it, even even in scenes with a big monumental moment, like like even Oppenheimer joining the deciding he would join, or that was actually a little longer. But scenes where Oppenheimer was, you know, creating the. Um, quantum what 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 whatever the 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 that program was at UCLA he was creating that program all the students were coming in and when times when, when at times when scientists were exchanging really important scientific discoveries and ideas like the one scene where Benny Safdie's character what's his I can't remember the scientist's name but he's a really famous scientist he was the one who created the hydrogen bomb um hmm. where he comes in and he says which, by the way, Brandy Safdie, we should shout out, wasn't in it for much, but his his work with, with Killian and some of those scenes are just are, are phenomenal. They're, they're so good. He's right. very much like the, even even higher than Alden Ehrenreich got with Robert Downey Jr., but his, his he's, become, he's, he's, becoming a, he's becoming an actor, a bona fide actor. I mean, TJ, you know him so well from directing, but, I mean, yeah. man, he's, he's going full actor here in yeah. this space. I mean, yeah, he's been in his own movies and shit like that, I mean. But well, I mean, I, I, it's nice to see like he's not just being a, a director that's yeah. like, oh, I make movies. I, he'll be in them too, which is kind of pretty cool. Yeah, and to take a big role in this movie, bigger than most, um, was actually really cool. I I was like, go him. Yeah, <laughs> he 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 played the part really well. Yeah. So I should probably finish my my sort of um, monologue here, but so. I was kind of confused at first why it was going so fast, but then I kind of realized 
more towards the Trinity test, like I was maybe halfway between the beginning of the film and the Trinity test, why no one was doing it that and realizing, I think through my own emotions, that in reality what that kind of fast that that faster pace was doing is it was building tension in me and 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 was and the audience and was accelerating us to this big pinnacle moment where they're dropping the tr- they're doing the trinity test and i think it reflects just how fast the government was trying to get things done and how fast everyone was working to try and get things done and reflected what was actually going on in the movie itself and so at first i was a, like a little bit confused but ultimately i came over that and i thought that was great and and again it kind of comes a full circle moment with what we were talking about earlier with the dialogue that kind of does affect that dialogue issue that I had but overall as I came to the conclusion with the dialogue it's ultimately serving a greater purpose in the movie and I love it for that and then to also see it the movie basically crescendo in a sense where you get these longer scenes after the trinity test and you get to sit down a little more but it's also needed right because you're having long lengthy interviews with emily blunt's character with his wife you're having the courtroom stuff that was obviously very much needed to sit down and get a lot of and get important several lines of dialogue between characters to to grasp all that and to understand and to really understand oh wow strauss is really screwing oppenheimer here with all the things that he's been doing the last several years and I, I honestly think that might be, again, recency bias is definitely a thing. That might be my favorite pacing of any Nolan movie because of how smart it was, I think. And, and, and again, there's other, the, um, Interstellar is a great, ed- well-edited movie. A lot, I mean, let's be frank, most of his movies are well-edited. Or is there anything I guess I should say that you guys would like to talk about before we before I move on to something else because I definitely could be missing something. I mean we talk well actually we, we kind of covered quite a bit here. So I, I guess what I will do is I will what time are we at? Okay. Uh the question that I was going to pose was um so this ep- this sort of conversation that we're having on Oppenheimer is in conjunction with Barbie, which we're going to see later. Barbenheimer, and I <laughs> I wanted to pose to you guys because <clears throat> I think it's a, I think it's an interesting conversation to have, and and I wanted to ask this question while John was here because John will probably won't be here for our Barbie conversation. Is why these movies are so successful. They had this great, great opening weekend. And I thought it'd be kind of a fun conversation to add, to, to add, to talk about why these movies are so successful because they aren't Marvel movies and they aren't a mission impossible movie. You have, um, a lengthy bio, what is essentially a biopic and you have Barbie. Why, what do, why do you guys think these this this duo this weekend these two movies are are so are so successful? Uh, okay, uh, I mean I mean shit to begin with I, I mean to begin with they're both by good people. To, yeah, to, I mean to start to win over the film side of things, you got Christopher Nolan who's one of the most famous mainstream directors, probably of all time. Let's be honest. Yep. Um, he's in there with he is in there with the Wes Andersons, the Quentin Tarantinos. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even people who don't know a lick about film, they know who Christopher Nolan is. Yep, it, it, it's just the way it is. And, you, and then you have Greta Gerwig on the other hand, who's probably one of the most like up and coming directors, who's made two back to back Best Picture nominator like nominations. Oh yeah, um, wow. and she's like, I mean, she's one of the hottest directors in the world, like Ari Aster and people like that. So like, yeah. How could you not be excited for her making a big, colorful movie uh, about, like, the legacy of something that's been around for, shit, like, 60 years? Mm-hmm. Um, that and, like, the internet. <laughs> Let's be yeah. real. As soon as we learned that Barbie and Oppenheimer were coming out on the same day, the internet lost its damn mind. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, I, it's just one of those things that's carried over. And then, like, 
it kind of turned out from like less of a meme to be like oh let's actually watch these movies and be genuine about it yeah and then like after that like it became like real barbenheimer uh where it was like these two are both gonna be like peak cinema for uh like what will be the next few years and then like i think everyone started appreciating and be like let's just not watch a superhero movie for once and let's go like invest in something that's actually worthwhile yeah um so i mean like that's i think a lot of the basics of it uh plus i mean you got good casts and uh like i mean just fun stories and stuff like that Mm -hmm. i mean oppenheimer isn't fun but no (laughs) it's interesting at least (laughs) well and that's why i'm glad we didn't do the barbenheimer double feature is because and no offense to well i'm i'm calling out a lot of people because a lot of people did see the double feature and I think I and I think this is true for a lot of movies. I'm glad we saw Oppenheimer by itself and not in the same day as Barbie because we had the chance to kind of digest it and think oh, yeah. about it on its own as its own sort of yeah I, movie. Well, I, I think that would have been the uh, the same thing opposite wise if like we went to go see Barbie because I've heard Barbie isn't it's not just a blockbuster movie. It's it gets deep in some ways. Yeah. And, like you're gonna think about it too. And like I I mean it's, I feel like it's gonna be the same way either way you watch it. Because it's, it's going to be like, oh, do you want themes of the world ending, or do you want themes of like, like, like this is this is what it's like to be like a woman in modern day? Yeah, like it, it, I think it's just like no 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 matter which way you bite it, you're still going to get the same outcome. You're still going to sit and you're going to stew for ten hours and you're like, shit, man, I couldn't watch another movie like that mm-hmm. back to back. So, yeah, yeah, I I contributed. <laughs> I'm glad we're see- I'm glad we're we're separating the two. Any final thoughts on we're like an hour twenty in, so we can wrap things up. Is there any final thoughts that you guys have on Oppenheimer? It was a wonder wonder wonderful experience. I'm glad we saw it on IMAX. I gave it four and a half out of five stars. That's my rating as teaches as well. I think I might lower it to a four. Oh, really a four? All right. We're back. Hmm. Final thoughts, as I was saying earlier, final thoughts on Oppenheimer, guys. What will you remember about this movie for years to come? Whether the just the singular, like the, just the, the theater experience itself, a moment in the film. What What are your your last thoughts on this on on Oppenheimer before we we close things up? You know, I don't want to dwell too much on this part, but okay. I did forget to mention in the editing realm. Okay. I'm just going to take it here for Jeez, John. A little bit. When they were talking about the different kinds of explosions um, and in what ways they could, you know, yeah. make a nuke, um, was basically, um, you know, it, they would describe the... Um, you know, the type of explosion they would use, implosion, whatever. And then it would cut to not waves, but the kind of explosion and was so violent and abrupt about yeah. it that it would, it, I feel like it encapsulated the, the whole um, process so well, like bringing those theories to reality. Um, you know, they're not doing some sixth grade science experiment. They're dealing with really, you know, human lives and the fate of the world and the war um yes but yeah that was that was another editing part i didn't want to leave out yeah so. great point thank you for bringing that up i i love that as well it all of those and the same can be said similar with the stomping how jarring all that is 100 no, percent. and <laughs> now that you say that i have so many other thoughts that are rushing to me so that's why i'm like typing i'm trying to write them down uh I will say that one thing that I wasn't ready for for this movie is all of the here the one thing that was that was a positive about having all of these different characters is all the different storylines that we got and all the different and because of that all the different great moments uh, dialogue exchanges and dialogue and character moments that we were able to see we didn't talk about we didn't talk about Florence Pugh and Killian Murphy, their performance, their 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 scenes together, <clears throat> so so good and emotional. And that scene where she says, "I need you, you can't leave," and he says, "No, I can't come back." 
because they're they're ta- they're making me stay there, right? They're going to get you know suspicious. Is really saddening stuff and adds adds depth to what would have just been a story about an atomic bomb, you know, being created, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. And to to spend valuable time going into that story, which is valuable in Oppenheimer's life, you know, obviously this did happen. There is sto- there is there is documents on this and, you know, a book on this that he did actually have Flor- Florence Pugh's character was indeed real. Mm-hmm. To have mo to to be able to have spotlight on that was was really valuable and really added to the complexity of the character. So then, when you when he does have those emotions, you feel for him even more because you st- you feel you feel he is not a scientist. You feel like he's a human being because you have the you know the great acting that we were talking about, but then you also have the actual human exchanges that he has with. Florence Pugh's character, some of the other professors before this whole thing kicks off. So I wanted to mention that before I forgot. And then the no, Nolan in an interview talked about how this is a borderline horror movie, or there were moments where it was basically a horror movie, and we got those, and I wanted to shout those out. Specifically, we talked about the the town hall scene briefly where he goes and has that speech and you obviously have that reoccurring stomping motif from that but you also have a very disturbing sequence or scene where he he's walking out and he steps on a um a, a dead baby and like a burnt up charcoaled up baby as well as seeing the flesh being ripped off of a woman's face, among other things. And and this can also go into the editing. How well that was was set up to where it was just kind of to really real quick cuts um with no warning whatsoever is very much something that you would see in a horror movie. And the way that it was edited was also very very horror like. In fact, there there I was talking to TJ about this at the at the when when we were out of the theater, but I mean it wasn't this weird, but it gave me it gave me subtle flashbacks to David Lynch stuff because of how it was cut. David Lynch in in movies that I the movies that I have seen with him and like the Twin Peaks season three, he'll often have one like one it usually it can be weird too, but one weird thing going on and he'll he'll just cut immediately to something in that same scene that we never saw before and show it or something or partic- or usually one the ones that stand out to me something completely like different and also weird and Nolan to me did a similar thing to add sort of a that jarring quality to it and hor- horrific have make you have this horrific response to it and I thought that was was kind of an interesting parallel that I, not a lot of people are talking about but I mean, TJ, you kind of got what I was coming from, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like it's—I mean, just the way things are set up, and we'll yeah, things a little closer. Uh, the way things are like set up, and like, I mean, shit, like that. I mean, it all starts off where it's like everyone's yelling and screaming, and then like it isolates to like one single yes. stream, and then like quietness, and it's like that inherently. It's just very David Lynch. Yeah, you watch something like uh, uh, like I said, Twin Peaks or something like that. Like, I mean, it's very like it almost harkens back to like the way the show ends. Um, right. Or something like a scene like that, or like, um, the Autry's dance season scene in like season three, where it's just like, it's like a weird scream. And then kind of just cuts out and you're like, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, like the visuals and like the, it, it, it is very like almost David Lynchy or, uh, something like that where it's like bizarre visuals that, in the end do coexide with like the, the feeling at hand, but you're just kind of like, you're taking it back. We're like, Oh, this is, this is, this is spooky. This is yeah. scary. Well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you confirmed that with me. Cause I didn't want to act like I was going insane. Um, you are John. I, <laughs> I probably am. Two other things I wanted to mention. And then I promise we'll close things out. John, you were talking about the, how they were, you know, deciding on what type of, you know, stuff to use for the atomic bomb for the mm-hmm. bomb. 
And what that kind of reminded me of, and John and TJ, John, you'll relate to this. TJ, you'll relate to this because you guys have seen his movies. But I kind of laughed at the thought of what if Michael Mann did this movie because it would be it would be an extra hour because that extra hour would be spent just about the scientists sitting down and like doing every single little intricate procedural thing about how to make an atomic bomb and put it together. And low key, I would watch that movie. That movie would actually be kind of sick because Michael Mann's so good at that, you know, getting you, getting you so interested in what, you know, voltage is a telephone line or a radio line. And, you know, that scene in thief and, and so that would have been real. I'd actually be kind of cool to see just the procedure, like go it really in depth with the procedural stuff. Cause that's Michael Mann. And especially with something as complicated as making an atomic bomb would be. Imagine if he actually did that. That would be kind of Take insane. A while. That would be that would be yeah, that would be years and years and years of just putting something like that together. And I don't think the FCC would be too <laughs> up for uh, yeah. having an atomic bomb being described in detail. That's a good point. You know, that's a very good point. But obviously he couldn't do everything. But like at least going more in depth, and I'm sure you could go more. In, you can go more in depth than what they did in the movie, obviously, without oh, like absolutely without them, you know, flipping out. But just giving it, giving it the Michael Mann procedure, not to that extent. I don't want Michael Mann to get in trouble, but and not that he would make this movie. He wouldn't because this movie just came out and whatever. But it's kind of a fun reality to pose that question of see of, of a procedural movie about the Trinity test would be would be something I would. I would buy multiple tickets too. So, well, with the the technical capacity of Christopher Nolan films, mm-hmm. I was surprised they kind of just grazed over. Really, I mean, the making of an atomic bomb is pretty complex. Yes, and describing all these different like um, methods of doing so. But you're I was surprised he didn't take 40 minutes to explain how an atomic bomb goes off. Well, not <laughs> like an inception. That, but, but, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, not not so much inception, but thinking about, um, you know, like Interstellar when they're, you know, talking about time and everything. And I guess mm-hmm. because that's purely theoretical, it's easier to yeah um, think about and, and and you know make cool scenes of. Um, but yeah, I, I guess he had to graze over it. Because had he gone into, you know, anything below surface level, he would have described so many yeah. different, yeah, you know, spider webs of information that it would just, yeah, it'd, it'd be too much. Yeah, everyone else, every, every normal person would be like, huh? Yeah. For you, like 40 minutes. And because knowing him, like when he gets started, he'll go, he'll just like explain shit for like, like I said, like Inception, he does that for like 30 minutes. Which is like it's Leo DiCaprio. And he's like, "This is how Inception works." And it's just like, "All right, you could have just like, we we'll bake this in a little <laughs> less." Like, I'm shoving this idea down your throat, and you're gonna listen to me rant about how dreams work for 30 minutes. <laughs> Which I mean, I like, and I think it's cool. But like, same time though, it's a weird writing thing that he does, and it kind of drives me a little bit crazy every now. And yeah, though. that one though, that one though could um, was I mean, because obviously he didn't do it with the the bomb stuff. But that one was could have been was a little more flashy to begin with. Yeah, well, I mean, like Inception is just the Matrix, and the Matrix does the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're practically the same movie, uh, and like, and I mean, they set themselves up exactly the same. So mm-hmm. I mean, uh, he kind of was just like, I'm going to reskin it with dreams, and like, I mean, uh, add some layers uh, to it. Yeah, add some flair because why not? And uh, but like. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the whole, like, explanation thing is, like, it's it's straight up the Matrix. Watch this yeah. movie within, like, a month, and you'll know exactly what I mean. <laughs> no, it, it's really weird. But, um, I mean, um, yeah, I'm glad he doesn't go very Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan-y in that kind of sense, because that, that would have drove me crazy. Yeah. Well, and it, and it gave, it gave, mo- it gave time for... Everything what, else. Everything else. What I was talking about earlier, Florence Pugh stuff, or... Whatever, other mm-hmm. other parts of the film, the, the courtroom gave more time for courtroom stuff. I imagine. Yeah. So it was it was enough to satisfy, but and not again have the heads of the audiences all explode. Yeah. So I think that is a as a as a good point to to bring up. 
the last thing I will mention before we close things out is because this was this was one of it literally was the first what minute of the movie, but it was like so chilling and so good was the Prometheus. A couple of lines there. No, it's like the first twenty seconds of the movie. <laughs> yeah, first twenty seconds of the movie. Brilliant. It was well. Talk about not not settling down, man. It was just like at the at the like the first thirty seconds was just of just cuts of random expl- like explosions and well, it's, it's it's like one singular shot and it's like a, a whole thing about Prometheus and you're like this is the movie. Well, this, yeah, but, but you the- have that, but you also have remember how that shows all like of, all the other different like that has the flares and stuff like that within oh, I that don't same thing. That. Isn't that in the same? You're talking about the fire in that frame as the quote is on the screen. Is that what you're yeah, saying? but that, soon, that, but that, soon that, after that, isn't there a bunch of cuts of like? It, well, I, I think it cuts to Cillian, and then it's like, it's like the opening of that, and then it cuts to RDJ, and it's the opening of that, and then they kind of meld that in with like t- talking about his backstory, and then there's a lot of those cuts where it's like a lot more of the uh, like the flares and stuff like that. Right, because when he's sleeping, it shows all like the laser stuff. Right and like all the all the little it does, dots. It, it does tons of that. Not I, just not just lasers no, no, or dots and about. stuff like that. It it does some of the explosiony stuff too. No, I know, but isn't that the beginning of the movie? Yeah, that's that's like the first twenty minutes. It's like it does a lot of that. Oh yeah. Well, anyway, that Prometheus thing was a nice touch, um, and I loved. I lo- I'm glad he brought that in. Think because you, you were able to think about that in conjunction with you know. Oppenheimer's journey, comparing Prometheus's thing with giving fire to mankind, and Oppenheimer giving the power of the atomic bomb to mankind. From the get go, it was just like, wow. Yeah. This is Brought a whole other gravitas to it. Mm-hmm. And one thing that also I was kind of thinking about, because it was just in my head from a British literature class I took, was uh, also thinking about it along the lines of Frankenstein, too. Right, where Frankenstein gives the power of immortality to mankind with Frank resurrecting Christine. the monster, the mm-hmm. creature in Frankenstein. So I thought that was a very um, relatable, also comparison. Because I mean, to be fair, they do actually re- they also reference Prometheus and Frankenstein. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes, so the yes. same kind of ideas. Yeah, well, it is. It is right. Yeah. It's it's Prometheus giving fire. To, to mankind, it's immortality. Immor- it's Frankenstein giving immortality to mankind, and then it's Oppenheimer giving the atomic bomb and that power to mankind. Really, and it's and it's also it's really cool to think about that because of the different timelines you're dealing with, t- different points in you know history or whatever that you're dealing with. You're dealing with you know obviously like Greek mythology, and then you're dealing with the 1800s. And then the 1900s with the atomic bomb, 1800s Frankenstein. It's like, it's really interesting to compare all those three and think about the, um, I guess like the, yeah, like the progression of how that's like changing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, obviously Frankenstein is not real. No, no, no one resurrected a dead body. Um, no scientist has done that yet as far as we know. But nonetheless, from a storytelling perspective progression it's a it's kind of cool to add that into into that have to have that trio were you gonna say something john i'm sorry no i you know uh, you hit the nail on the head just being you know it's this is something very real that we're dealing with today right in this case it is legit it is an actual legitimate thing the atomic bomb and walking out of the theater i was like how is this not on my mind all the time yeah i think it's it's scarier. It, it, it's more terrifying to know not of the atomic bomb's existence, but knowing how easy it is to forget the power every country pretty much yep. around the world has. Yep. And that's what Nolan talks about. Like that he, he you know, in the 80s, there was like all that atomic bomb scares. And like, well, him growing up faced that. And um, so, so definitely it is real. And I was going to go somewhere. Oh, yeah. It's also, you know, we were talking, comparing the three, it's also interesting to see how those char- those individual characters are treated, right, by bringing this, by providing this newfound great power 
to mankind and how they're how they're viewed you know throughout you have prometheus who is chained up by the gods and is getting his liver eaten out basically Mm, by an eagle (laughs) delicious and then you have and then you have in frankenstein you have all this all this pain that's brought on by this monster going around and I don't mean to spoil it too much, but killing people basically. Yeah. Um, I won't say who, but killing people. And and then you have this atomic bomb who, you know, it's what Frankenstein I feel like does and this movie does is and even even with fire itself, it really does show this great sort of juxtaposition of like it's terrifying and all these things have done de- done deadly things to people but also like all the the either like the scientific achievement or the triumphs mm-hmm. that those also brought you know what i'm saying oh yeah absolutely and so to think about that is also kind of freaky in a sense you know also kind of it makes it makes the conversation more interesting because it isn't just one way, necessarily, mm-hmm. and I mean, sort of. You, uh, you depending on what perspective you decide to look at it as, you know, mm-hmm. like if you look at the atomic bomb from a scientific perspective, it's phenomenal. It's like that's incredible. Mm-hmm. I can't believe you know humans were able to do that, and the same could be said for Frankenstein as well. But then there's again the flip side where it's har- har- harmful and kills people. Kills people, and that's just not natural. It's no. not. It's not. It's not human like. It's not. Humans weren't made to be immortal, right? They weren't made to. They were. They. We, we all have a finite amount of time, um, and the atomic bomb is unnatural in itself. I mean, you know, yeah. with how destructive it is and things like that. So. Yeah. So anyway, that was uh, as an English major, I, I just had to had to mention some sort of book here. But um, I'm glad I was able to bring that up because I think it is it is it is it is it is important it is important and it is relevant for this for this discussion. Very much so. so mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, that that was a long um, section of final thoughts. That was 25 minutes ish of final thoughts, but. I'm, I, I think it was worth it because we added so much more to the conversation. I'm glad you brought up that some more editing stuff there, John. That was good. And thank you for, for being here with us for this conversation. It was a little bit more serious. I And, and I think it was needed for Necessary. something like this. 100%. I, you know, we're not, we're not idiots all the time. Just, just 95% of the time. This was yeah. the 5% that we weren't idiots. Yeah. And we weren't making jokes and... Stuff. It, it was it was hard to make jokes coming out of that theater i know well we it made heavy. I, I will be honest i'm not gonna lie we were definitely made we definitely made all the barbenheimer jokes and the we made some you know this goes to actually john to what you were saying about how like you kind of just forget about like all the nuclear devices we have in the world and you kind of just forget about that threat that was very much us at the beginning of the movie you know, making all these jokes and stuff like that, who, yeah, I'll be honest, they weren't exactly always appropriate, but oh, making yeah. all these jokes humor and then... Like intended to be offensive. <laughs> no, they were, they were. Yeah, well, I mean, humor in general. Right, right, right. Something usually... We, we weren't, we weren't actually funny. being... They're jokes for a reason. We weren't actually, like, being serious about oh, all this enough. stuff. Yeah. But it does, it does supplement what you were saying which is like you just kind of forget about all that and you don't forget about the 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 damage that can be caused and basically like with a push of a button and the world in the world yes and i mean that's why we haven't had we never had a world war three is because everyone had nukes and so if world war three came it would just be nuclear war and everyone would die so yeah. that's why uh, that hasn't happened yet but people are saying AI might make World War Three, but whatever. Um, there might be like an AI World War Three, but at least from that perspective, it hasn't happened because of that. But um, so yeah, I guess I was just going to say that it, it was a great example of we were making all those jokes coming to the theater, and then coming out of it, it was very much the us realizing, oh yeah, like 
remi- reminding ourselves of this threat that is out there. Yeah. And the destruction it causes. So, it, 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 there's a real there's a real world situation with what you were talking about there. Um, but yeah, well, thank you everyone for for listening. Mm-hmm. We 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 glad we're glad you sticked around. Hopefully, some of you watched this. It is up on YouTube under the same name as the podcast. Next episode, TJ and I will be talking about Barbie. Mm, Maybe yeah. with Riley. Hopefully with Riley. Or just by ourselves. Something, you know, yeah. Something like that. And, yeah. And then after that, oh, TJ finally watched Creed 3, finally. It only took me, how many months is that? Like, five months, is it? Yeah. It only Something took me like five that? months to watch Creed 3. Yeah. But I kind of forgot it existed. <laughs> but look forward to that. We're gonna we're gonna talk about Creed th- three. We're gonna rank all of the Rocky movies. We're mm-hmm. gonna do that because TJ and I watched all of them in preparation for <laughs> for Creed three, and then I rewatched all of them again. Remember that? Or I rewatched the first four again. Yeah, I had a, I had a stretch where I watched thirteen Rocky movies in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. That's just that is Johnny Phillips. As it is. So um, anyway, yes, I'm well versed in the ro- in the in the Rocky movies now. So that'll be a fun podcast. That'll be a nice change of pace. That'll be fun. Mm-hmm. And the camera is flashing at me. I think it's telling me it's about to turn off. So we'll say adios, and we will catch you on the next episode of the Manic Movie Misfits podcast. Peace. TTFN. <laughs> what does that mean? Hot off for now. Oh, okay. Okay. You don't remember Tigger from Winnie the Pooh? Yeah? Yeah, he's this TTFN. He says that? Yeah. Oh. I didn't even know that. <laughs>